Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The date is December 2nd, 1978, and uh, I thank you for that. Believe me, today's the day. I don't care if I've been sober 50 years. I don't ever want to forget that today is the day. Now, this is a typical AA deal. I drank for 22 years. I've been blessed with sobriety because of people like you and this wonderful program for a little over 25 years. That's a total of 47 years for anybody who's counting. And I finally get to speak at a conference of AA, and they give me three minutes. (laughs) And no chair. (laughs) So... That's typical, hey, right? Okay. So let me try to tell you in three minutes what happened to me. 22 years of drinking, nine automobile accidents, five of them total, jail, nut house, shock treatment, ruined marriage, screwed up career, several unhappy girlfriends, the whole nine yards, and a very unhappy employer, and a wife who wanted a divorce. That was the first 22 years of fun and games. And I still thought I was a social drinker absolutely believed I was a social drinker. I mean, I'd only been arrested for driving while intoxicated twice, <laughs> so it's not much of a problem. And uh, But actually, in the, uh, the second year, in ni- 1976, two years before I was blessed with this program, I, I did go to a course that they taught uh, at the, uh, the uh, automobile school the police provided for those who were arrested for driving while intoxicated. This was in Rochester, New York, my hometown then. And I learned that I was a problem drinker. There were three kinds of drinkers. Social drinkers, problem drinkers, and alcoholics. And I was a problem drinker. So I simply solved the problem. I limited myself to four drinks a day, carefully measured, no more, no less. I didn't cheat. I didn't line them up at five five minutes of midnight and then have four then and then four or five minutes after midnight. I thought about it, but I didn't do that. And believe it or not, I stayed on that diet for 20 months. Because I had heard that if you were alcoholic... You couldn't stop, you couldn't control your drinking. And I figured as long as I control my drinking, I'm not an alcoholic. But of course the night came when I figured I'd solved the problem, so I had the fifth drink. And probably the 15th, and unfortunately I found my car, drove it into automobile accident number nine, and was arrested for driving while intoxicated for the second time. Now I was in a little more trouble. My wife was very serious about a divorce, and so I went to a guy who'd been in AA for 22 years. He was a personal friend of mine, a Catholic priest, and a wonderful, wonderful man. He saved my life. He'd been here quite a while. And I said to him, Vince, here's my story. And I just laid out those 22 years for him. I said, do you think I might be an alcoholic? He said, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? You've been going to AA meetings for 22 years? Don't know what an alcoholic looks like? He said, Webb, it doesn't matter what I know. Alcoholism is the only terminal disease known to man that must be diagnosed by the patient. He said, if you don't figure it out, if you don't learn that you're alcoholic and you don't do anything about it, you're doomed. So I knew he was pretty serious, and I said, well, what do I do about it? He said, you go to AA. And he sentenced me, believe it or not, to four or five meetings a week for three months. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't join Rotary because it meant once, once a week, you know. It was far too important to go to that many meetings. Uh, but I agreed. I said, okay, I'll go to four or five meetings a week for three months. And I won't drink during that time. And he said, well, as far as that goes, he said, why don't you do it the way I do it? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean a day at a time. I said, come on, Vince, you've been sober 22 years, and you mean to tell me you you don't drink a day at a time? He said, that's exactly the way I do it. And he pushed a napkin across the table. We've been having lunch for a couple of hours. He pushed a napkin across the table. He said, read that. I read it. It said, dear God, I want to get through today without drinking, but I can't. You can enable me to. Please do, just for today. I place my will in your hands. And that was it. No amen or anything. Now, he didn't make a big deal of it. He said, say it every morning for two weeks, first thing you do. And if after two weeks it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't mean anything to you, throw it away and forget to give you. Well, I said the prayer, and I stayed sober for the 90 days, and I kept saying it. And that's the day, way I started my day this morning. But I was no quick learner. I said it for over a year before I realized I was taking the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous every single morning. And that's the way my day starts today. And I came to a lot of meetings. Probably for the first two years I went to a meeting every single night because I was so damn lonesome. My wife did divorce me, thank God. Uh, by five months after I came in the program, she got a divorce. I was really ticked off and became her dating coordinator for a while, but uh, 
Uh, that finally went away when I started to get well. After not drinking for almost four years, a guy told me it was time to get sober. I thought I was sober because I wasn't drinking or taking any other drugs. But he said, no, you're not sober, dummy. If you'd read the big book, you would see that sobriety means peace of mind. That's the way it's defined. And he said, I don't see peace of mind. I see a lot of jealousy and anger and so forth. So he took me through the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh, and I just made the greatest discovery of my life in those middle steps. And that is my problem was not booze. and never had been booze. My problem was web. And I had to do something about that selfishness or self-centeredness or it would kill me. And God made that possible. And God made that possible through the steps and through people like you and people on the podium up here with me. And I just don't know how to express my gratitude because my full, whole family has been restored because of this fellowship. Eight years after that beautiful woman divorced me, she remarried me. With our, yeah, talk about brain damage, huh? <laughs> three, our three kids then in their 20s brought to their mother to the altar to marry their dad. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful occasion. So that's my story, and I owe it to you, and I thank you very much for letting me have this few minutes to, to share that with you. Thanks for saving my life. Now we can start the real part of the meeting, and I'd like to introduce Barbara from Pleasanton, who will read the preamble of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you very much. What a thrill to be here. My name is Barbara R. I'm a grateful alcoholic. Hi, I'm from Pleasanton, and my sobriety date is February 11th, 1979. I was very young when I got there. <laughs> and this is the preamble to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, it says here that Betty from Walnut Creek will uh, read a portion of Chapter 5 from the big book. I think it's known as how it works. <laughs> Betty? Hi, I'm Betty, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Betty. Hi. How it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. The chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these, we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power, that one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 
Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, what an order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after made clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he were sought. Thank you, Betty. And uh, the 12 traditions will, re- will be read by Claire from Walnut Creek. I mean, from, from Dublin. I moved, and I didn't even know it. I'm Claire, and I'm an alcoholic from Dublin. Hi, Claire. <laughs> and uh, my sobriety date is sept- uh, September 3rd, 1977. The 12 Traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Our com- one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should remain should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our traditions ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thank you, Claire. Sorry I relocated you without your permission. (laughs) Now let's see where we are now. Um, An introduction to the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will be presented by Steve from San Ramon. My name is Steve, and I am an alcoholic. And uh, my sobriety date is March 28, 
Just for you know, I'm the youngest guy up here. <laughs> I uh, like to say one thing. Uh, it's pretty much an honor. The guy that took me to my first Alcoholics Anonymous is on this panel also, so that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, I'm supposed to introduce the 12 uh, steps. What I, I guess what I can tell you is that we started out with six, and we changed it to 12 at one point. Uh, so the people that had, before the big book, there was only six steps, and that came from the Oxford group. Uh, and, and you can find that in the book, and you can find it in some other stuff. Uh, there's some things that I'm going to read. I, I'd rather read than tell you my opinions too much. Uh, I, I can tell you my opinion, but you probably wouldn't care. What, what I found is, is some stuff like uh, right here in the 12 by 12, it talks about AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which is practiced in a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink, enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. So that's what the 12 steps are kind of about, to make us whole and useful. Uh, one of my favorite lines is, is in the uh, big book, and, and I guess I believe that that uh, there's more to the program, you know, and, than just going to meetings. So, and that's why they wrote the book, and that's why we have the 12 steps. And uh, one of my favorite lines is this one, and it says, "We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough." So that I think that's where the 12 steps would come in. And, and uh, I uh, also like this part in here where it talks about the 12 steps that summarize the program may be called, I can't pronounce it very well, it says, Los Dos Poso, in one country, less Deuce Tapes, in another country, but they trace exactly the same path to recovery. So I guess it doesn't really matter where we're from or where we come from, as long as we work the 12 steps, it'll get you to the same place. So we just need to work them. Uh, I also like the part, uh, I like the part where it talks about, uh, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. All we have to do is completely give ourselves to this simple program. And, uh, and I think that's important that we know that all we have to do is give ourselves to this simple program. And to me, that's, you know, the whole program and part of the whole program is the 12 steps. Uh, the other thing I, I don't know how, uh, one of my other things that I like to talk about a lot is in the 12 by 12 in the third step, and I'm not trying to steal this from you guys. Uh, when we acquire the willingness, he is the only one who can make the decision to exert himself. Trying to do this is another, an act of his own will. All the 12 steps require substantial and personal exertion to conform to the principles. So this is our part, guys, is we have to conform our own will and exert our own will to work these steps. The other thing that I know for me and I've learned is that I've not been able to do this on my own, that without help, it is too much for me. And uh, what I do know is there's a panel up here, and these people are willing to give us the help and try to help us learn about the rest of the steps, and I'll let them do that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I moved from Rochester to Boston shortly before coming to, well, 10 years before coming to California. And uh, about five years ago, I heard, him, I heard a guy summarize this whole program the best I ever heard for me. He just said, the 12 steps of the meat and potatoes of AA. All you have to do is bring the vegetable. <laughs> so, so here's the vegetable, right? <laughs> okay, we're now going to practice the uh, seventh tradition, which states in part that we are self-supporting through our own contributions. Please be as generous as, as the baskets are being passed as you can. Thank you. This will be taped by the Northern California Tape Librarian. Tapes may be purchased at the end of each meeting. If you wish to order a set of tapes, please order as soon as possible. Sets may be picked up on Sunday at the conclusion of the conference. Also, please stop by the Good News Table to obtain the latest issue, as well as subscribe to one of the best and oldest newsletters in the country. Be sure to stop by the Delegates, delegates re Registration Table. If you're a group delegate, you will need a blue 
delegates blue ribbon to vote at the open delegates meeting tomorrow afternoon. Now our theme for this afternoon's meeting is the old timers do the 12 steps. It is now at this time my pleasure to introduce people that I can guarantee you have practiced these principles in their lives or they wouldn't have been here for more than 25 years. As I said earlier, I came in for only 90 days. It's an awfully good thing I didn't know this worked. But I found out if you did it, it worked. And I'd like to uh, ask each person as they come up to try to adhere to the five minutes and uh, please introduce the next person on the agenda because I'm going to come down and sit in the audience and enjoy this. Um, so talking on step one is Bob from Castro Valley. And uh, I'll introduce Bob now. Oops. Yeah, I'm Bob Alcoholic. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Always good to be here with us. You know, uh, this has been the longest 25 minutes I've ever spent for a while. <laughs> and I don't envy number 12. <laughs> no. My sobriety date's November 6, 1976. And, uh, uh, I'm supposed to talk in the first step and, uh, briefly. And, uh, what brought me to the first step was I remember the last day I drank, um, as of today. It started early in the morning and it finished early the following morning, one or two o'clock in the morning. I finally made it home where I'd been going like I usually do two or three days or this was a single day. And uh, I remember I came into the house and my wife said something to me at the time. I remember I slapped her and she slapped me back. And then my daughter said something to me and uh, I remember slapping her and she slapped me back. <laughs> We talked years later about this stuff, you know, and they said, Dad, we, you know, you just kind of gave us a little fluff and we really laid it on you. <laughs> yeah, I, I never felt a thing. And yet, see, I'm covering 27 years of drinking in a couple of minutes, so I'll just try to hit the high notes. Yeah, you know, uh, when I came in, they said, you know, if you took the Irish out of AA, you know, we could hold these meetings in the phone booth. <laughs> and that's what it was when I got here, you know. And, you know, it's funny, I love drinking. Shot a Kessler and a Budweiser back, you know, and if it still worked, you'd have a different speaker here today. <laughs> and I can't, you know, thank Alcoholics Anonymous enough, uh, what brought me to my knees. I remember what Young said that, that uh, usually, uh, change comes about as a result of calamity and collapse. And see, I'd never hit a woman and the two closest women in my life before or since. That one night totally destroyed this alcoholic. I get feeling shivering right now and it's been a, few days. But that's what brought me to my knees. It's funny, I went into the bedroom and I fell face down at the floor and uh, two words came, it's over. Didn't know what they meant then. And from that day to this, I have need or have to have a drink, no matter what. And I've been through a few things that could have got the poor me's going. I, believe it or not, they haven't, haven't registered in the days because of you people in this program called Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, uh, this drinking thing, like I say, I never thought that this act that night would be the catalyst for me to be able to stay sober like God had a new way for me to go. But it took that catalyst. And Young was right for me as far as I'm concerned. From that day forward, I remember I came to my first meeting on November 9th, 1976. And uh, in that meeting that night in Castor Valley, I remember I didn't know anybody. I'll never forget Ralph and Winnie were there. And those two people knew, looked at me and said, Bob, you need more than just an hour of meeting. We'll show you a fellowship that's open 24 hours a day. And I just grabbed this program. And that's, I believe, to this day that uh, admitting that night and talking with alcoholics in that meeting that I knew there was something they were saying that I needed and wanted to come back. I had never met these people before in my life. And uh, so, like I say, that actions of that day on November 5th, was a catalyst for me to be sober today, to finally for the first time admit to my innermost self, like I said in the third chapter, that I am powerless over alcohol. Because I finally, you know, I did a lot of things. I'm a bar drinker for a lot of years, and even a lot of us that were bar drinkers knows what goes on in bars. And never that guys getting it on never phased me. You know, never phased me. 
but hitting women, that was, uh, I didn't realize. When I heard somebody in a bar say that, I used to uh, pride myself saying, I handed that guy easy. Because the guy that bees on a woman ain't a man anyway. And then when I finally did what I said I would never do. And it's hard to explain this miracle that t that's come about. That uh, everything, like I said, as decent as has happened to me has been a result of being able to maintain sobriety one day at a time. I want to thank you people for letting me be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about this whole thing? You, you, th you get, they give you enough time to think about this, like a half a year, you know, and your brain goes crazy if you're an alcoholic like me, don't you know? But I gotta tell you, there's two things I was worried about. I was worried about what kind of people come to a 3.30 on a Friday afternoon ANA meeting, don't you know? So look around you, it's the kind of people, they stay sober. Now the California economy might go to hell this afternoon, but you guys, you know, when you go back to work, you're all sober, and that's really cool. The second thing I was going to t say is I was going to make a commitment to you that I would not speak longer than five minutes. I like commitments like that. And then my wife came and got my watch. She is sitting on the front row. She is a front row kind of lady. She's the best front row kind of lady you'll ever meet. So if you want to meet a class act, find Betty. She waves cards at me that says, do this like quit. Do this like you ran out of time. She's always waving cards at me all the time. Some I learn, some I don't learn, don't you know? That's the way that is, you know. Anyway, I'm here to talk about step two. Step two. Um, we do a Sunday night beginner's meeting. And I, I've always had to simplify the steps because I'm a farm boy, i got to tell you. And those multisyllabolic words just blow me away, you know. And as loquacious as we might be, I try and keep it short and simple. Here's the deal. First step says, ain't it awful? Second step says, man, I sure hope somebody will help me. Third step says, I guess I'll let him. And it's that simple, don't you know. We, I, complicated. Here's the other part of the problem with that whole thing, though is that this insanity deal. We we need to find that higher power, use that higher power to help us. But if you're an insane person who's been doing the same things and expecting different results, which is our definition of insanity, it is difficult. It is nearly impossible. It's what they call a catch-22, sidebar issue, catch-22, for all you young people. There was a Second World War. In this war, there were people who flew from London, they were bomber pilots, to Germany, dropped bombs. Life expectancy of a German pilot, I mean a, a British pilot on those bomber runs was eight missions, eight missions. If you lived to 22 missions, you got to, to the point where you didn't have to fly anymore. The odds were against you ever getting it. That was the catch-22. The same thing is the catch-22 about sanity and insanity in this program. You've got to get sane enough to understand that you need some help. And you've got the insanity saying, I don't know how to do that. And that's what the problem is, one side weighing off the other. So what you have to do, I figured out, is have to show up at a whole lot of meetings, figure out where you belong in the thing, and just keep showing up. And that's what we talk about in the newcomers meeting, is just show up. The three most important words are keep coming back in this program. I have, you know, I've been fortunate enough, I, this is Friday, I'm, I'm sober all this Friday, I still consider that a miracle on any given day of the week that I'm still alive, don't you know? But I happen to have been sober a really long time since Easter of 76, and I go, wow, pretty, pretty awesome, pretty amazing. But it took me a lot of years to get that first year of sobriety, because all I could do was keep coming back. I was one of those insane individuals. So, you know, if you know some folks who are having problems with making it all work, if you know some folks or if you happen to be one, I really understand that because this program is so insidious. It is so depth down. It's so, it is such a strong program. But the problem is we're, we're weighing it against something else, the deal of alcoholism. And the problem with alcoholism is it just overwhelms about 90% of the people who drink a lot. You know, we happen to be a fortunate few who've gone through the steps and made it this far. That's why you're here. You like to be involved. You like to participate in it. And that's what you're about. 
Congratulations. She is raising a one. This is my commitment to you is 48 seconds from now. I will sit down. <laughs> Keep it simple, Gary. Do not complicate this sucker, you know? And, 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 that's, and that's the way it is because I, I am just still overwhelmed as I walk around going, wow, I've been sober all day long, don't you know? And that is just the greatest thing going, and you have to do the steps to do that. And I thank you all for showing up. I thank somebody for saying, hey, come on in and talk for a few minutes, you know? And the next person coming up is, is Jim. And Jim is, has a few minutes less than his wife, Colleen, that he has to introduce, and that's the way it ought to be. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. My name is Jim Moore, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jim. My birthday is, uh, my sobriety date is July 14th, 1975. Um, because of these steps and a loving God has, has expressed himself in this program, I'm able to stand up here before you tonight. I... Uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, I didn't love the steps when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous. The steps were were something for uh, the older folk to do with. I was a young guy when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a head of hair. Um, uh, actually, Steve had a head of hair back then too. <laughs> um, I. Uh, yeah, you know, I I fooled around with the first uh, the first two steps, but uh, when it came to the third step, by the time it was my sponsor asked me when I was ready to do the third step, uh, I was probably about six months sober. Then I was an authority on AA. I had memorized the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I could quote you page, chapter, and verse, and uh, that was a real pain in the ass. Uh, I. Uh, I, you know, I knew everything that was about the third step, and he says, when are you going to do the third step? And I says, I've already done it. And, uh, and he says, oh. Uh, he liked to say, oh, a lot. Uh, he said, uh, who did you do it with? I says, you've got that wrong. It's the fifth step you do with somebody. And, and, and I said, no, it's, or he said it was, I told him it was a fifth. He said, no, it's a third. And we went back and forth. We were coming back from an H and I commitment and we didn't have a big book in the, in the front part of the car. So he pulled over and uh, broke out the big book and it said that this, uh, this is a step we took with another person. Um, and I was, um, I was a little perplexed about that. I didn't quite realize I wasn't going to give him the, uh, the satisfaction of taking it with him, however, uh, I, uh, you know, I, the third step was uh, I had no no concept of the power of God when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I I did not believe in a God. I didn't didn't want to believe in a God, and it was hard for me to uh, to make a decision to turn my will and life over to the care of God. Uh, I had um, I had just no uh, no hope. And, however, there was my sponsor and some of the people had me practicing and acting as if there was a God. And during this time, I came, I came to believe and I came to have a higher power. But I was raised, uh, like a lot of people in my generation, that you do it all yourself. You don't rely on somebody else. You don't, uh, you know, you just try a little bit harder. And uh, and that's the way I felt with the third step. I didn't need to turn my will and life over to the care of God. Uh, however, at uh, at a year sober, after refusing to do step four and five, uh, I attempted suicide. And uh, and there is something to uh, the muzzle flash of a twenty two caliber pistol that makes you think that there's something. Uh, it made me think there was something uh, in these steps for somebody as unique as me. The problem was I wasn't going to do four and five, and the reason I wasn't going to do four and five is I hadn't done three. And I got a, got a hold of some people, and we talked about it, and we spent a lot of time talking about the third step. And I got on my knees, and I was told that I had to get on my knees because somebody with an ego as mine, such as mine, had to do that. And... And, and we all took, we all said the, the, the third step prayer. And it says in there, we, we have to think carefully before, 
before we do this, before and be ready to utterly turn ourselves over to uh, before we do this. And I, um, I did this, and you know, I felt that it was okay, but you know, things still weren't right. I was, uh, I was a year sober. I was still, I was unemployable. I was, uh, I was insane. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden I got a job up in Northern California and I had never lived in Northern California in my entire life. I lived in, uh, was born and raised in San Diego and I was living on the beach in San Diego and it was a pretty nice life and I couldn't see coming up to Northern California. And, uh, and the people in my home group told me that they need, that you guys needed help up here. So I was probably <laughs> good that I come up and I, I actually believed them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I remember stand, standing in uh, this room that I was living in at the time, and I can remember looking up at the ceiling, and I couldn't get a job. I had a job in Northern California, and I remember saying, okay, God, we'll do it your way, but if it doesn't work out, don't blame me. And that was probably the most honest uh, third step I ever did. You know, it was arrogant, the arrogance of an alcoholic, but I, you know, that was the way I took it. And I got to tell you, I moved up here in 1977. And uh, of the 12 people presenting the, the steps up here, five of them and I attend meetings together at that time. And, uh, and it's good to see a lot of old dear friends up here. Um, Steve and Colleen and I actually started the first, were part of the group that started the first young people's meeting in, in the Tri Valley area, and uh, and there was a lot of fun and uh, you know a lot of sobriety back then. Uh, when I got up here, I uh, I I was going to a meeting and I found this. Uh, I won't go. I, uh, I I ran in. I ran into this this pretty little Irish girl up there, and um, and she's our next speaker. Um, we've been uh, married 25 years. And, and today is her 29th birthday. Whoa. Okay, so I was thinking about getting up on the table or something here. I'm Colleen M., and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Colleen. Hi, everybody. My Friday date. Thank you for taking my thunder, Jim. <laughs> it's uh, March 12, 1975. Happy birthday, dear Colleen. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. And, yeah, I, I've had some messages today. I had one of my sponsors. I told Jim, I said, I'm leaving the parking lot. I walk up to my car, and I'm on the passenger side, and I'm not paying attention to this car next to me. The window's down, and I start to get in my car, and she goes, Happy birthday, Colleen. <laughs> it was one of my sponsors. I mean, they're tracking me down all over the place. What I'd like to say is that... Um, for me, step four, I was never going to do that. I was never going to do step two either because I had never been locked up in a funny farm. I wasn't crazy. <laughs> what I started to do was um, I grabbed the Hazleton guide. There were a lot of, you know, I just, I'm easily distracted. And that was just, I was going to take my time with that. My uh, second sponsor, Jane O'Toole, and I say Jane O'Toole because she's since gone on to the big meeting in the sky. I was absolutely overwhelmed with her. I was 23 years old when I got sober, and she had 24 years of sobriety. And she was the director of Stepping Stone, where, where I ended up at about three and a half months of sobriety. And she used to have to remind me that she was the director of the house, she was also my sponsor, and that I could come up to her office and talk to her. That's what her job was. So for me to be, I was so disorganized, and uh, I talked to her about how, you know, finally when I realized, because I had become suicidal in that uh, first year of uh, sobriety, and it was because I was not working the steps. 
So my second year of sobriety is when I did my first fourth step. And I talked to Jane about this because I still was pretty much a squirrel, and I just wasn't getting that outline in the big book. So I sat down with my legal pad. I still do that. I don't know what it is about a legal pad. I mean, you're doing a moral inventory. And she suggested, you know, that I, I pray to God as I understand him and did that. And there were times I could begin to write, and I would just write and write and write. Well, I was still into the blame game at that point. And I didn't quite understand that, you know, like I tell my sponsees today, you know, you've got your resentment, your I'm, I'm resentful at, and why, and what it affects. And I said, and then there's that telling imaginary fourth column. That's where the rubber meets the road. That separates the um, uh, little girls from the big ladies. And I said, that's where we begin to own our problem. We begin to own our behavior. And it's about writing it down. This is what I share with my sponsees and something I've done over the years is when you write it down, you own it. It's not about, oh, it's just whirling around in my head and I've done all these fourth and fifth steps in my head. And Okay, all right. For me, and it's something also my sponsor today, dear Marguerite, and she's not here, she talks to me about, she'll say, well, hon, what's your part? What's your part in this, babe? And so then I have to really look at my behavior. So for me, that that's where I have really gained some emotional sobriety, was being able to not only own my part, but then I'm able to do a very healthy fifth step. But the fourth step was about, I mean, I remember there were things I was taking to my grave. You know, yeah, this is a fearless moral inventory. And there was just stuff that, well, it came out in my fifth step. It wasn't supposed to, but that was God's plan. Um, I think that it's, for me, God as I understand him is a reconciling God. And in the first uh three steps, four and five, he is reconciling me to himself. And then the fourth step is about me getting some harmony and some reconciliation just between me and God, getting the slate cleared between me and God as I understand him. It has left me with, um, like I said, emotional sobriety. I have a whole lot of days where uh, I have contentment and gratitude and that self-honesty. You know, I'm no longer afraid to make mistakes. I think for me, especially the fourth step, writing it down and owning it, um, I learned that I have an eraser on my pencil. And for many years, I did not have one. And it caused me to drink and do a lot of damage. So I'm getting the one-minute sign. I didn't think I could do this for five minutes. But thank you. And, yeah, I'm full of gratitude today for my birthday. And hi, Penny. Hello, my name is George. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, George. Uh, my sobriety date is January 11th, 1975. I'm very grateful to be here. I, uh, I felt kind of funny when uh, I was asked to be on this panel because uh, there are several people at this table today who were at my very, very first AA meeting, and they knew I had no intentions of sticking back then. <laughs> I wanted to get rid of my wife, and they helped me do that. And... Uh, <laughs> And I've been here ever since. <laughs> I got the better of the two deals. Uh, uh, when I was told I was going to do the fifth step, it was very interesting. Uh, I kind of laughed in a lot of ways because uh, I was raised Catholic, and God, I hated confession as a kid. I, I just didn't like it. Uh, but I go every Saturday. I prepare myself, walk into the confessional, and I promptly lied to the priest. I don't know why I lied, but I always lied. I, I always felt lousy doing it. And, uh, but I did, because I had to. And when Kathy told me which step I, uh, I was going to do, I, I called my sponsor. And, and i got to give a, a plug for sponsorship. Uh, I've had the same two sponsors since my first meeting. They picked me up and brought me to my very first meeting. And one of them passed away a little over two years ago. And so... I got my old other one out of out of uh, mothballs, dusted them off, and I'm using them again. And and he's the one uh, I used for doing my fifth step. It's a, he's a very interesting man to say the least. 
but I'm very grateful to have a sponsor uh, and to have one for as long as I have. Uh, the fifth step is, is, is very interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, it says admit to ourselves, admit to, admit to God ourselves and another human being the exact natures of our wrongs. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get into this program if you don't want to stop drinking. Uh, I found out that that's the secret to Alcoholics Anonymous, having wanting to quit. If I didn't want to quit, there's no way in the world I could uh, willingly go through these steps and, and make myself available for this thing called sobriety. There's no way I could possibly do that. And it took me 90 days of going to meetings to figure out that I didn't want to go out there and fight the bottle anymore. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I just wanted to give up. And when I did that day... Uh, I went in and asked my sponsors to be my sponsor, and I said I'd go to any lengths in order not to take a drink again. And any lengths was to do the steps, was to do them all. And uh, and the secret to the fifth step is basically having done a good job on the first four. Made the complete surrender, turned my life over to care of God, and willing to let him run it and take a, take a stock of where I'd been. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I knew I'd done a lot of crazy things in my life, but I never knew why I did them. I never knew why. I just never knew I was out of step with the world. I just thought I was a, a victim of a lot of bad breaks. But I had no idea that I was creating all those bad breaks myself. So when I finished my fourth step, I, uh, it took me a while. It took me just short of a year or just a little bit over a year. I'm not sure of the time period, and I don't recommend that. I got on the phone, and I said to my, I said to Bill, are you available to do a fifth step? And he said, yeah. He said, I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, come by Thursday or Friday, whatever day it was. I said, I'll be there. And I went to a meeting, and I knew I had a couple of days in order to, uh, uh, to gather myself before I was going to go talk to this man. And the thing is, in our book, it says that, you know, if we don't do a, a good fifth step, we try to keep some of these secrets to ourselves, there's a good chance we won't get over drinking. And if we hold back some of these things and we don't drink, we won't have any peace. I said, oh, my God, I don't want to get drunk anymore. But, you know, I'm not willing to tell Bill everything about what happened to me. I'm willing to write it down, but I'm not sure I'm going to cough up everything that, that I that I did write in that uh, fourth step. So Friday night came, and I picked up my fourth step. I got on my knees and says, God, help me tell the truth this time. I said, I'm sick and tired of lying. But, you know, I think I'm going to tell Bill everything, but I'm not sure I'm going to tell him this one thing. <laughs> And so I went to his house and we talked. We talked and we talked and we talked. We had a wonderful time. He was telling me, I was telling him. We were laughing. We thought it was funny. You did that too and all this other stuff. Yeah. We had a good time. And then he says, well, I think we did it. And I said, I think so too. And we started burning up my uh, my fourth step. We put it in his fireplace. He said, you know, you shouldn't leave this around because your wife would really get upset if she ever found it and read it. So... We got halfway, we got halfway through tearing up the pages and I held out that one thing. I wasn't going to tell him. I just wasn't going to tell him. And he looked at me and he says, hey, Georgie, my boy. I said, what'd you want, Bill? By any chance, did you happen to overlook something or forget to tell me something in your, in your fourth step? And I said, oh, shit, God, I got, I think I want to cough this up. But you know, he pulled my covers and I did. I'm glad I did. And it's the one thing I said I would never share with anybody. Never. And I finally told it to Bill, and I, a number of years later, I was able to share the these same incident with several other people who I happened to sponsor. So it was just one of those things. I just did not want to lie anymore. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be able to walk and look a man in the eye and know I did not have to hide who George really was. It took me a lot of years. It took me over 35 years to find out that George wasn't a bad guy. And, you know, AA helped me do that. And if anybody's having trouble doing the fifth step, I give you a simple suggestion. Don't think about it. Just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am Oren. I am alcoholic. My sobriety date is January the 10th, 1974. Thank you. And for that, I thank the people, the power, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, uh, it's absolutely astonishing and, and a wonderful feeling to be up here surrounded by so, so many friends in long-term sobriety. I was saying to, uh, to Webb and to, uh, Bob earlier that, uh, 
it's nice to be surrounded by old timers in suits and you're all standing. You know, because usually <laughs> one of them isn't. And uh, it's just a real joy that today we're all standing. Uh, my dear friend, our dear friend, the late Dr. Earl M., uh, once said that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was born in Akron, grew up in New York, moved west, died in Southern California, and was resurrected in Northern California. <laughs> and uh, I'm grateful to be here. <laughs> I, uh, and welcome to those who may have 25 years or less, uh, <laughs> if there are any of you out there. I, uh, you know, when I came here, I had, uh, I had demonstrated to the very best of my ability what I could do by my own will and by my own decisions. And uh, I was young, but I wasn't pretty. And I had the good fortune of my sponsor introducing himself to me on my first night of sobriety. And he said, hello, Oren, I'm Eddie B., and I'm your temporary sponsor. And he remained my temporary sponsor and for the next 28 years until he went to the big meeting. And he said... Uh, my job as your sponsor is to put into words that you can understand what I think you need to hear during your early recovery. Any questions? And uh, no. And he said, are you ready to try something new? Are you ready to try and go in a new direction? Yes. Are you willing today to do whatever it is that I suggest that you do? Yes telling me that he would never ask or suggest anything of me that he had not already experienced in his recovery. So he essentially was asking me to do what he had done. And that, to paraphrase, is what the how it works in Chapter 5 tells me, is if you want what we have and do what we do, you will get what we have. It doesn't tell me that I have to do what you have, or have to do what you do, only if I want what you have, if I want freedom from what I have become. And that's what, on a daily basis, I have gotten to do from the day I met Eddie B. I have a daily <coughs> reprieve to make the choices that I want to make. I can either continue on this path, or I can decide to use my uh, other mind to take me where I came from. And step six, uh, the wonderful thing about being step six is that I would have thought earlier in my recovery how wonderful. I have more sobriety than five people. But at this stage of my sobriety, I think how absolutely wonderful. There are six people who have more sobriety than I do. And that's a great joy and a wonderful freedom in, in, in seeing this. Uh, but step six, uh, we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. Uh, I had, through the practice, the daily practice uh, of the steps one through five, uh, and surrendering to a power greater than myself that I didn't have to understand, I just had to believe in, uh, I had gotten to the point where I liked this idea of being free from uh, the things I would say, the things I had done, the places I went. This hadn't happened since the day I came in, and life was getting a lot better. There was an incredible freedom that I experienced in sharing my fifth step, as George said, with my sponsor. We interacted. My sponsor was not an instructor, per se. Uh, he wanted me always to, in our readings, when we, read the, when we were working the steps, he said, I want you to go and read this. And I will read this, and the next time we get together, I want you to tell me what it means to you, and I'll tell you what it means to me, and perhaps we'll both learn something new. There was no right or wrong, or you misunderstood. Uh, he wanted to learn as much what it meant to me. So uh, by the time I had worked my, done my fifth step with Eddie B., uh, and in the presence of God of my understanding, I really did want to be free from that which caused me the kind of life I had known before I got here. And uh, I wanted to move on. I wanted to become the happy, joyous, and free people I saw sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I had seen, as Father Tom said, I had seen the warnings as well as the examples sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the common denominator among those who had the happy, joyous, and free air about them was that they had worked the steps in the order they were written, 1 through 12. And they were continually living them on a daily basis, not only by practice in their lives, but also by sharing them with others and through sponsorship. And uh, I've never taken a vacation from Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't take it then, and I haven't taken one since. Um, I was ready. Uh, I, I was ready for God to remove the, uh, the very character defects that had become a part of me and that I had so uh, cultivated that would keep me from becoming the person I could be if I continued on the path of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
So the choice was clear. Uh, I had very little difficulty in, uh, in taking the sixth step. Um, I was entirely ready. And, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll let you know what I did next, but not by my words, uh, but by passing it on to Barbara R., step seven. Hi, everybody. I'm Barbara R., and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> My sobriety date is uh, February 10th, 1973. And, and I'm very grateful for my sobriety, and I know that, you know, I wouldn't have it if you weren't there. And um, step seven is really about humility, and um, I have to say the thing that's really humbling to me is that um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought I'd just be here for a little bit, you know, to get my husband off my back. And, you know, and then I, you know, could go out and, you know, just kind of get back to normal, whatever that was. And, um, and, and sometimes I'm just so blown away that, you know, it's 31 years later. And here I am today at a, you know, afternoon off and at the, um, old timers meeting. I like long timers, but, you know, <laughs> they always say old timers. Anyway, um, the, um, step seven is, um, is humbly asked them to remove our shortcomings. And, uh, I think for, um, for me and probably for a lot of people, uh, six and seven kind of go together. Um, it is interesting, I think, that, uh, in the big book, um, the least amount of writing on the steps, you know, is about six and seven. And it seems to me that, um, that um, six and seven, you know, those defects of character and our shortcomings um, have a lot to do with why uh, we got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Um, I am um, I'm trying to think about this, this humility thing. And, and I read um, the 12 and 12 today, and I, you know, looked over some things. And I, I, I'm thinking that um, for me, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I had no idea of what, humility was. Uh, I had an idea of what it was to have humiliating experiences. And those are the things that did get me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, but it told me in the 12 and 12 today that, um, that, that we had to have some humility to be willing to work that first step, to admit our powerlessness to, um, believe that, you know, a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. That takes a bit of willingness, and with that willingness goes humility. But this thing about, you know, asking God to take away some of these defects, you know, some of these shortcomings. Um, I, Where I got sober, there, there were some people who said that they really liked some of theirs, and they were not going to give them up. And, um, and, and I know for me that uh, there were some things that, I held on to for a long, long time. Uh, there is a line in the book, you know, about, um, you know, the alcoholic can not afford to be angry. You know, it's that luxury that's for other people. And, you know, I always like that saying is, would you, you know, you know, rather be right than happy? And, you know, for a long time in my life, I would have rather been right than happy. And, um, but I don't feel that way today, at least not all the time. There are times when, you know, those, the defects rear their ugly head. Um, you know, it took me a long time. I was thinking about, I'm a nurse by profession, and I've, I've been a nurse for almost 40 years. And, um, and, and it's really funny. I remember one time I was, uh, starting an IV line on this, um, young gentleman and, um, and he said to me, how long have you been doing this? You know, I wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. <laughs> and very pridefully I told him, oh, I don't know, 33 years. And he said, oh boy, you know, I wasn't even born. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, God always gives me these little things, you know, and, you know, just these little humbling things. And, you know, I think about that. Um, I know for me that, that, you know, I, I have things that I struggle with day in and day out. A lot of things have been relieved, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky. But I had the wrong idea about the sixth and seventh step, and especially the seventh step. What I thought was that, um, I could heal myself. 
I thought that, you know, if I got good enough, that, that then I would be healed and I could go to God in all this radiant goodness and say, here I am. <laughs> I'm ready to have my defects, you know, removed. I'm ready to have my shortcomings removed. And, um, and, that, and that's not how the step works. The step really is about asking. It's about, you know, the humility to ask God to do for me what I can't do for myself. And, 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 and to go to him in my imperfections. There's a line that Gandhi said about that we need to lay our imperfections and our failures at God's feet, just as we do our successes and, you know, our talents. And, you know, that's how it is for me. And, you know, I need to ask him every day to take them away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name's Jack. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jack. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, this is step eight that I'm going to talk about, and that is uh, made a list of the people we'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. It's uh, this step for me uh, helped me out in getting to the bottom parts of my pain because I had a lot of it when I got to this stage and I couldn't figure out why. I really didn't know what was wrong with me outside of I drank too much. But when I got that out of the way and I come down to this, to this step, it, it, it says that it's going to free me from my isolation and uh, I can be close to God and I can be with my fellows. And and I said, that's what I want. That, that's what I want. I want to be free of this shit. <laughs> because when I got here, I was sick of my life, you guys. I was sick and tired of what had become of me. I didn't have an ounce of integrity. I didn't know what honesty was. I couldn't love you if my life depended on it. And so, boy, that's isolation, I'll tell you. And it, the bottom line underneath that is a loneliness. You know, you all know that loneliness that seeps into you and eats you alive. And you can't get out of it. And that's what that brought me to AA. Only I didn't make the decision. God made it for me. And I really appreciate that. Because here I am, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I had to write my life story out around this step. I had to find out what the hell happened. You know, I lived all those years. I was 42 when I got here. And I didn't have a clue what was going on. I married an Irish Catholic girl, and we practiced the rhythm system, and I had six kids. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and they rhythm system all right. I could, I could never carry a tune. I want to take you back when I was born. I was born, uh, my mother was uh, an alcoholic. She had me when she was 15 or 16, something like that, put me in an orphanage in, in uh, San Francisco. And I spent my first two years of my life in that hospital over there, waiting for somebody to come along and adopt me. But they wouldn't do it. It was tough times, and they weren't going to pick me up. So uh, then what happened was that she got married and, and come and took me out of the hospital there. And But it was pure hell living with her, you know. So I stayed with her from the time I was two until I was six. And then by that time, I was thoroughly screwed up. I mean, because it was drunkenness all the time. The shades were drawn, you know. It was chaos. I'd have to get my breakfast of oranges in the morning because there'd be nobody to fix it for me. They'd all be hung over and sick. It was like that. Then she took me up to Winters, California, dropped me off and left me there with an aunt and uncle I never knew or heard of. And, it, you know, they were old, 50 years old at the time. I thought that was old. <laughs> and uh, and so they hadn't any children. And, and Aunt Katie says to, to uh, you know, that she would just love to have a kid, you know. And my mother says, why don't you take this one? And she says, really? And I said, yeah, sure, you can have him. 
So, so that's what, that was it. I stayed with them, and it was tougher than hell because they were normal. And I couldn't get used to anything. I was always in trouble. I was antsy. It was already screwed up. You know, there's no chance. And Katie was soft and sweet and loved me, and I didn't appreciate any of it. You know, I had an uncle that pounded my ass all the time, and I didn't appreciate that either. And so I ran away when I was 16. I said, I had enough of it. And that was it. And the boy, I had my first drink, and from that on, that was the answer, you guys. You know, I thought, now I know it. Well, I tell you that because I want to get back to this step of the, of the pain that's inside from the loneliness and isolation. My mom said, I'll be back to get you in two weeks. I sat out in the damn front uh, curb and waited. Never showed up. Didn't see her until 17 years later. Not a word, nothing. Damn, it broke my heart. Shit, I still fight the damn stuff. But I know now what's happened. And so this step calls for forgiveness. I didn't have to forgive her because I didn't know her. I didn't understand any of that that happened to me. But I did know this, that that I was uh, screwed up and lonely and my heart was broken and that I couldn't get out from underneath that. So I just had to suffer with it till I got into AA and started looking around and see what the heck I could do to change it. And so I wrote my life story out the best I could because it asked for specific things from me about who I harmed and how I harmed and what happened. Well, I, I'm having a hell of a time figuring that out because they asked me to go from my time present back each year. Well, I couldn't do that. So I went from time I could first remember and then brought it forward every year. And uh, what I discovered was that as a result of that pain that I never wanted to feel that pain again. So I buried my feelings just like you do. I buried those feelings down in there to where I did, I couldn't feel anything anymore. Now I pretend. And why do you think I'm a jolly fellow? Because I want you to love me. I, you don't abandon me for God's sakes. You know, it's like that. So I play a game. I tip tap around you guys. And so you like me. And it's really hard because I can't like myself. I can't muster that. So there I am. The only time I ever felt that there was a God was when I was baptized when I was six years old. And, uh, and it was Easter time. And I went up into the hills in winters there. And it was the spring of the year. And the wildflowers were all over the place. I run up that mountain and roll down through all those wildflowers. I'd just been cleansed in the water. And I felt like six million dollars. <laughs> and I've been trying to get back to that ever since. <laughs> so uh, that's what happened to me. Now I know what. So I go back and write my life story out, and I, I come to the part where my mom leaves me, and I, I can't get through it. So what I have to do later is i got to get some help with this because I can't get down to, to my pain. I mean, it's so bad. Shit, it screws up your sex life. You know, you can't tell the truth. You don't want to let anybody know that you're different or funny inside. I had my oldest son die, and I never felt a thing. Now, I knew then I was in deep trouble. And, and that's the way I went. So I couldn't, I could talk to you guys about it, but it didn't seem like you understood what I was trying to tell you. So I went and got help. And I, three times over my lifetime of being in AA, I go back and, and get a checkup and talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, something like that, so they can help me. Uh, refeel that because each time I get some freedom out of it each time the pain is less each time I talk about it it gets less and less you know and now as a result of how much no time left take another 10 minutes (laughs) I'll tell you thanks so very much Uh, I'll have to quit now Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Joan, an alcoholic. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> anyway, my sobriety date is uh, July 29, 1968. 
It is wonderful, isn't it? It's so wonderful. Uh, I have, I think, five people on this panel that I, I'm friends with and have been for years, and it's wonderful. And lots of friends out in the audience. Just uh, thank you for all your smiling faces. Uh, I did have one experience here up on the table tonight that I've never had before, drunk or sober. And usually when I get nervous, my stomach gets a little queasy and, you know, but my lips started flipping up and down on me. And I thought, what is going on here? But it passed, so anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, my step that I'm supposed to speak on is step nine on making amends. Uh, uh, now, see, I'm nervous. I can't say that step by heart. Anyway, what made direct amends to those we had harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. And uh, thank you. Uh, you know, to me, um, this step, this was hard. This was not an easy step for me uh, to do. I wanted to do it, but it was not easy for me to do. And um, my sponsor told me I would just take my inventory, and that's where I would make my list for my amends. And, you know, a lot of those amends, I thought some of those people owed amends to me, you know? <laughs> But she told me, no, this is your side of the street. You have to clean up. And, um, you know, I set out to do my amends the best I could. And I knew I couldn't do it alone. I had to have God's help. And I know God did for me then uh, what he still does for me today. And so I uh, made amends to my children because I, I drank mostly at home. Most of the harm was to my children and to uh, my husband. And um, I tried to do amends to them, especially the children, by just special attention and being there for them. And I, I know being sober is an amend, but it's not enough. There has to be more. And um, anyway, I, I feel my children were young, so there's a lot they didn't know or remember. But I did make amends to them as best I could. And I did have a financial amend I had to make. And the uh, big book says that sometimes we're greeted well and sometimes we're not, but we make the amend anyway. And I called this dentist and gave him my sad tale of woe and said I wanted to make amends. And uh, he was so wonderful to me, uh, just could not have been nicer. Of course, he wanted to know how Ken was doing, my husband. They all, everybody always wants to know how's Ken. You know, how's Ken doing? <laughs> But anyway, he told me, set it up any way you want to take care of that. So, you know, I knew um, God was with me. Um, but my other man, you know, I have one of my men's with me tonight, and that's my husband. And, you know, I try to keep my program kind of simple, because I'm uh, kind of simple and complicated, but I'm kind of simple, too. And, uh, you know, there are ways that I've tried to be good to him over the years. And this way he never knew about, but I'm going to tell you tonight about it. And did you say, oh, my God? <laughs> anyway, you know, um, I, was, I'm, I was a stay-at-home mom. I was the wife, and I was the cook. And my husband loved meatloaf. Well, I hated meatloaf. I hated it. All I could think of was a big glob of meat with raw onions in it. That's how my mother cooked it, you know. And I, I would not make him meatloaf, you know. So I got sober, and I was sober, you know, a year or so, and I'm trying to do amends certain ways. And I thought, oh, my God, I'll make him the meatloaf, <laughs> you know. And I can tell you I make a mean meatloaf now. And, yeah, and the interesting thing is I love meatloaf today, you know. And we have a little health issue, so we had to cut out the beef, and I make a good turkey meatloaf now, <laughs> you know? So anyway, uh, the men's, we, we just have to make them because this is where what I was told, my sponsor said, you're going to get to a point where you're not going to look up at anybody, you're not going to look down on anybody, you're going to be able to look them right in the eye, and I could never do that. And step nine, that has helped me in that step to get there. So, you know, God does do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And it also says in the big book that step 
nine. It's not a spiritual theory. We have to live it. This is a spiritual program. We have to live it. And um, have I run out of time? I'm just going to part, leave with what Chuck C. I heard Chuck C. say, and it helped me so much in my early sobriety. And he was talking about having lasting sobriety, day at a time, but a life of sobriety, and that's what I wanted. And Chuck said, you know, they say there's no loss and all this in AA, but he said, I'm um, 12 steps. These are the steps which are suggested as a program recovery, and these are the steps we took, and you better took them. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Bill Mason. I'm an alcoholic. Hello. My sobriety date is June 3rd, 1967. That's the way I feel about it, too. <laughs> you know, the uh, continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong, promptly admitted it was a little problem with that step, you know. Number one, being wrong, <laughs> and then admitting it, you know. But uh, anyway, I'll tell you what, you, you, do come to, uh, you do come to put these steps to work in your life. You know, the three are like an awakening, you know, step one's the problem, two the solution, three the commitment to pursue the solution, and we have the house cleaning steps, many amends, and then, you know, steps 10, 11, and 12 are, are steps of maintenance. And I can tell you that uh, maintaining sobriety for me was, uh, you know, you had over the years has been just very important. The last thing I want to do is hear that uh, cell door clang on the drunk tank again. And I don't want to be crawling out of a wrecked car or uh, looking at a disappointed family. I uh, sincerely uh, want all those days to be behind me. And it's true, you know, you took these steps. We take these steps and we put these steps to work in our life. We apply them in our life. And I, uh, I've heard Chuck Chamberlain talk a number of times, and one thing he uh, almost always said at those meetings was that... Uh, there is no substitute for the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he probably repeated, say, there is no substitute for the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. So you're not going to phone it in. You're not going to mail it in. You're not going to fax it in. You're going to be there. <clears throat> and I can tell you that I've uh, been sober a long time. It's over 36 years. And there are times that uh, I've not really put the tenth step to work in my life. You know, I mean, a lot of my defects I thoroughly enjoy, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you, if you, can, you know, when you participate in the meetings, there will be somebody say something at a meeting just rings a bell with you. And it's always with me. It's either I'm doing something that I, that I should not be doing or I'm failing to do that something that I should. And it's bring, bought, bring, being brought back to reality by the people in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that allows me to stay sober. Because I can tell you that there, there isn't another vehicle that I know about or have heard about or anything else. Take a man of my nature, the alcoholic nature, and the, having the disease of alcoholism and, and take me from where I was to where I'm at. Uh, there isn't, uh, there isn't one, and I'm sure that you realize that there isn't one for you either. But it's persistence in this program. Because I can tell you that there's a lot of times that I uh, have strayed from maybe the straight and narrow or whatever, either a financial or other transgressions. And it's only been Alcoholics Anonymous that permitted me to come back. Because I can tell you that uh, the and when, I, I, when I'm into doing things that I shouldn't be doing, it's going to eat a hole in me. It's going to, and it'll cause a cancer. And if I don't go back to those to the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I don't continue to participate and if I don't share my life, et cetera, with uh, people in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to get to that uh, point of uh, just desperation and be out there drinking again. And I can tell you, you know, I uh, I, I stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, I know a lot of people up here. I know these, these guys here uh, very well. Uh, Steve Presti, I took him to his first meeting. Claire, and, you know, Betty, I know Jack, remember? I'm going to tell you a story about Happy Jack. Now, he, now there's, a, there's a marvelous, marvelous guy. I mean, believe me, and we don't call him Happy Jack for, uh, for no reason. He's a, he uh, promotes this program, and he's a, an embodiment of the spirituality of this program. He does a tremendous job. But in, yes, indeed. 
That's it's Betty. <laughs> prior to Betty, we'd always, if I was cheering, I'd call on Jack and get the whining out of the way first, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it just tells you what the what the tremendous attraction is in this program and in the, in the transformation that comes uh, comes for us, but. Without the application of these steps, you know, it's a living program. You know, it's a living program. And uh, using the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will permit you to stay sober. And, I, you know, I have a good time in Alcoholics Times that I uh, have strayed from maybe the straight and narrow or whatever, either a financial or other transgressions. And it's only been Alcoholics Anonymous that permitted me to come back. But I can tell you that... Uh, the, and when I, when I'm into doing things that I shouldn't be doing, it's gonna eat a hole in me. It's gonna, and it'll cause a cancer. And if I don't go back to those, to the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I don't continue to participate, and if I don't share my life, and et cetera, with uh, people in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm gonna get to that uh, point of, uh, just desperation and be out there drinking again. And I can tell you, you know, I, uh, I, I stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, I know a lot of people up here. I know these these guys here uh, very well. Uh, Steve Presti, I took him to his first meeting. Claire, and, you know, Betty, I know Jack. Remember, I'm going to tell you a story about Happy Jack. Now, he, now there's, a, there's a marvelous, marvelous guy. I mean, believe me, and we don't call him Happy Jack for uh, for no reason. He's a he uh, promotes this program, and he's a, an embodiment of the spirituality of this program. He does a tremendous job. But in, yes, indeed. That's it's Betty. <laughs> prior to Betty, we'd always, if I was cheering, I'd call on Jack and get the whining out of the way first, you know. <laughs> but it... It, it just tells you what the what the tremendous attraction is in this program and the, and the, and the transformation that comes uh, comes for us. But without the application of these steps, you know, it's a living program. You know, you know it's a living program. And uh, using the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will permit you to stay sober. And I, you know, I have a good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. I go to Nursery Three, and we get a lot of young guys there. If they call on me, sometimes I tell them, hey, you young guys, you know, I've been sober longer than you've been alive. I may something, they say something important. You better dummy up, you know. <laughs> which is, which is very true. You know, it's very true. And you learn as you go along and you learn that, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, it tells me in the bid book that the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, our code is love and tolerance. And I didn't come here honest, open minded and willing. And I had a little love and very little tolerance. And if I have those things today, it all came because of people like such as yourself in meetings like this. And I'm just delighted to be here. We'll now hear from the Polish princess, Denise. <laughs> My name's Denise, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Denise. <laughs> I thought I was demoted, but I, I was still standing, so. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, this is, uh, reminds me like when we used to have uh, small meetings and, uh, we were sitting around the table and it was getting closer to me. My heart was going faster and faster. And it still does. And I think it's because I care, you know. You guys have given me my life. I said to myself, I'm not going to be emotional, but i got to say something funny. You know, that reminds me when I was uh, at the convention, international convention in Minneapolis, you know, and uh, we, we, I was at the Polish uh, meeting, and the room was, would seat only 120 people. And I was in the front row, and they would go like for each row, and somebody had to say something, but they were given only one minute. But the, all they had to do is just say their their name, where they came from, and how many years they have in the program. So I told them, I said, uh, my name is Denise, I'm an alcoholic, and my sobriety date is 4th of July, 1966. And they all... <laughs> 
and they applauded for a minute. And I say, you're taking away my minute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please don't applaud for five minutes. <laughs> this step is so important because it says so through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood it, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So when I pray to God for improving my relationship with him, it doesn't say, to you know, when it says to improve my conscious contact in God, it doesn't say achieve, because I will achieve it when I'm dying. That will, I will achieve. But as long as I am praying, it's I only have 24 hours. Every day I have to keep my slate clean. Every day I have to have this contact with him. He's a part of my life, just like the air, food, and and uh, everything around me. The beautiful trees, the flowers and everything, the changing of the season, this is part of me, and the part of me is that inner peace that I get only if I contact God. Nobody can give it to me. You know, you guys can be very nice, tell me a lot of beautiful things, I can go to marvelous movies, but I won't have peace in my heart until I contact him. This is a practice every day, you know, because it's just like you have to eat every day, you have to breathe constantly, you have to do that. And I'm saying you, but it's really me. Everybody works your prog- their program the way they feel like, but for me, this is what's keeping me sober. At the beginning, when I first came, somebody has, uh, uh, when they read, the, you know, this step, you know, uh, sort of prayer and meditation, and I heard sort of prayer and medication, <laughs> and I said, oh, I found my, oh, that's it, that's it, <laughs> this is my problem, is something wrong with me, they're going to fix me up, you know, <laughs> but then they said something about meditation, and some higher power. And I'm a Catholic. I said, who's higher power? What's the meditation? The Buddhas, the monks. This must be some kind of a cult. I don't, but they're going to give me medication. <laughs> so I will stick around for a while anyway. I couldn't understand what was going on. I was so confused. I was constantly comparing myself. People were in jail hospitals. I wasn't there. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Finally, a guy got so tired of me listening. It's saying, you know, I didn't do that. He said, what the hell are you doing here if you didn't do that? (laughs) So, uh, you know, we have found a way. We have found a way. And each one of us that is sitting here, you know, has to work their program to their, their own capability. But we have to do that. You know, there's so many beautiful prayers in the big book and in the, in the 12 by 12. The prayer of St. Francis is, uh, uh, the first time I read, I said, you got to be kidding. Everything for them? What about me? You know? <laughs> but I understand. I cannot love somebody if I don't love myself. I cannot respect people if I don't respect myself. You know, all these things were both ways, but it starts with me. So thank you very much for being here. (laughs) Hi, everybody. My name is Bud, and I'm an alcoholic. And I got my Bugs Bunny tie on. Remind me not to take myself so serious. I must have made at least 5,000 12-step calls and hadn't had a failure yet. I've always come away sober. <laughs> First time I heard, heard that said was from an old fellow who was on an H&I committee, and he called himself the old goat from San Diego. I'm an Oki truck driver, married to a German librarian. <laughs> We went into culture shock when I picked her up on a milk rock 56 years ago. She saved my life many times. I feel real emotional. The way I got here is I got here backwards. I come in off of a drunk. I sobered up many times on my own before I come here. I said, God, please take my life or give me something better. April the 9th, 1959. And he's 
sent me to 706 First Street, and I had black hair then. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a lot of old gray-headed people. Some weird names like Peg Leg Mary. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and they had a guy in there by the name of Harold. They called him the Kingfish, and he said he'd had 10 years without alcohol in a few moments of sobriety. <laughs> And I had a guy, Norman O., who said he was going to be my sponsor. He said he had the same problem I had. He could quit, but he couldn't stay quit. See, I'm a World War II veteran, now a Korean War veteran. I was recalled for the Navy, Korean War. Incidentally, my grandson got home from the Gulf. Come home. I got two great-grandchildren, which I'm going to go see. And the only reason I'm here today is this young lady called me because I was going to take off to the Gulf down to Oceanside today to see my great-grandchildren. I was doing something real important, too. I was spreading... I won't say it, Norma. Uh, <laughs> Steerman your <ray. laughs> in my garden. <laughs> I'm supposed to clean up my act. You know, ex-sailors and ex-truck drivers have trouble with their tongue, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, so I'm glad you called, because this has renewed my spirit. I was sober more the first day I came in than I am now because of the defects of character. Thank God for these 12 steps, especially the 10th step. I have to inventory myself continually. Otherwise, I'll take credit for my sobriety or the guys that I so deal. There's a guy over here from Texas, and I was telling him today that Joe Lee from Tyler, Texas, saved my life when I was two and a half years sober because he, I went to a meeting that I didn't want to go to. You know, us Okies didn't particularly like the Texans during that time. But, you know, that guy touched me that night. He had me crying one minute and laughing the next. And I was full of self-knowledge because I had memorized all 12 of these steps. And my sponsor told me, he said, work this program like you shift the gears in that truck. You know, I used to drive a truck, run milk tankers to the Bay Area, 76,000 pounds of weight, a lot of, no horsepower, a lot of gears, you know. He said, do you think about doing that? I said, no, I just do it automatically. He says, I want you to work these steps until they work you. And so I go promptly and memorized all 12 steps and called him and, uh, and recited him to him. <laughs> and he says, guys like you don't make it, so I'm going to get you a co-sponsor. <laughs> and, and my co-sponsor was an old quack doctor, a chiropractor who had been kicked out of medical school. And his job was he, uh, the, he knew every cop in Modesto. And the cops would call him and say, one of your buddies is drunk on the 7th Street Bridge, and Doc would go get him. And, and how he would know I was in town, I don't know, but he would call me and say, I want you to go on a 12-step call with me. And so we would pick, take these drunks to his, he had two offices, and we poured honey and grape juice down them. That's why we used to do it in 1959. Didn't have any recovery problems in Modesto. And he used to tell me to keep your mouth shut and drive. You got any money, put some money in a ga car and gas in the car. He had an old Dodge that had plastic seats. And my job was to wash the puke out of the car. <laughs> so I really believe that, you know, I, I, I was counted as a high-end drunk because I had a good truck driving job. I never even got dirty. I just transported milk to the bottling plant and uh, still had the first wife. They said in 1959, if you still had your first wife and your wristwatch, you wasn't ready for this program. <laughs> but they didn't question me because, you see, I come in so beat up. They said, boy, you need this program. <laughs> so... I want to tell you that I'm thankful today that you renewed my spirit and it reminded me that I'm sober in spite of Bud. And I want to remind you to pray for Hawaiian Nick. And I want you to know that uh, I lost a granddaughter last February the 10th from this days. had been five years sober. Her mother's been sober 14 years and got a cold, couldn't make it today. And her son is the one that made me a great, great grandpa. Oh, God, this is a wonderful program. I see people here from all over. You know, I've been to been a lot of conferences. I have 10 meetings in 38 states, and it's just the same all over, except sometimes you're disappointed. My first time I went to a meeting in, in Skokie, Oklahoma, I see the zero. I thought, boy, these people here in my old hometown are going to be glad to see me. <laughs> Five years sober, you know, I was going to tell them how the hog eat the cabbage. <laughs> The only one who spoke to me was a girl from California. She says, hi, bud. <laughs> hi, everybody.
that's what we're talking about. That's right. That's right. Awesome. I'd like to thank all of the members of this wonderful panel and thank... <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of you, too, because none of us would be up here unless there were some people that went before us, and none of us would have stayed here unless there were some people coming after us. So um, thank you all again, and will you please stand now to help us end the meeting with the Lord's Prayer. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.